And so I went to ChatGPT and it would do an okay job of finding some articles, but like 90% of it was useless to me. And then Grok seemed to be like the most efficient, by far the most efficient model, just by pulling accurate information, giving it to me that's relevant for my research and whatnot, right? And so I use Grok a whole lot. What you're describing, I mean, I assume obviously it would be a vulnerability with any LLM, but are you finding them in like mainstream LLMs like ChatGPT or Grok? Sure. So I got bad news and worse news for you. Oh boy. The bad news is that, uh, yeah, this, this took place in this instance in ChatGPT is what they were using on the back end. The worst news is that we've seen this vulnerability pattern more than once. This shows up in, I'll say, a, a substantial fraction of chatbot integrated applications that we test because so many of them do support Markdown uh, and don't turn off all of these exfiltration vectors within Markdown because developers aren't used to considering an image as anything other than just like this benign piece of the application. Like, sure, maybe somebody links an image that is inappropriate or whatever. Like, okay, that has limited impact. But now, because images send data off, we're seeing a vulnerability materialize in a case that it that only existed in, in very exotic attacks in the past. Like there were issues with um, OAuth uh, SSO flows where you could get access to uh, the code variable um, and then take over somebody's uh, like OAuth permission token. And you would exfiltrate that through an image and the refer header and all of that. But it's like really complex and nuanced flows. And now all of a sudden images are one of the most prominent exfiltration vectors that we see for data when it comes to AI. And again, going from bad to worse to even worse than that, most organizations are seeing these types of vulnerabilities pop up and not just the markdown exfiltration, but all kinds of AI stuff. And then they, they respond with, okay, how do we add guardrails to the system to fix it? And the point that we continue to drive in to, to every ear who will listen is that guardrails are not a first order security control. I compare it to like a web application firewall. It's a heuristic. It reduces the likelihood of us being able to pull off an attack. And it makes us have to think a little bit more carefully about it. But in application security, 99% is a failing grade. So if we're not implementing hard line security controls between the data we want to protect and the threat actors who are trying to get, to get access to it, we've already lost the battle. So we need to stop thinking about this in terms of like, okay, well, how do I add more guardrails, layer this on to make ChatGPT less likely to do the things that the bad guys want? Because we'll never get there. It's natural language. What we can do though, is figure out where are the, there's the data coming from that influences these language models running in different environment contexts. What does the language model have access to when it's exposed to that data? And we begin severing these source sync chains whenever they arise. So you can still have situations where a language model is reading data from the user and it can do something interesting or useful with that data. But as soon as you expose it to content generated or influenced by a threat actor, you got to cut that off because now it's no longer the user's LLM. That data belongs to the hacker. Wow. Okay. That's interesting, you know, because the whole like guardrail term kind of came about really with like cloud security and this whole shift left mentality, right? Like build in the guardrails by default so our devs can go in and play around and not break anything, not get us breached, right? That was, that was, and still is the mentality, but that mentality really doesn't work in LLMs. It's a bit more fluid than that. And it's a different attack vector than like what you said, right? With a WAF, a WAF is inherently pretty dumb and you know, it, it's kind of up to you to figure out how to get around it, you know, with the different rules and whatnot that it has. So it's, it's like a different methodology, you know, and which also kind of, so I was looking at a product and I won't name them yet, but I was looking at a product and they have, you know, AI security, right? Like I'm sure there's going to be a million security companies within 12 months that have some AI security thing. I'm sure that there probably already is, but the way that they did it was essentially like a, like a proxy for whatever LLM, you know, that you were interacting with, which it doesn't solve the vulnerabilities on the LLM side. It just prevents your users from interacting with it in ways that you're not approval approving of, which it solves the problem, but it also doesn't fix the problem. But does that make sense? Right? Like, I think you understand what I'm saying. Like it, it kind of like puts a bandaid on it, but it doesn't solve the underlying problem because the underlying problem is in the actual logic of the LLM. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that because I, I stopped myself, but one of the most prominent solutions that we see from, from different organizations trying to deal with this is they try to set up an AI gateway 
where they have a centralized management system where all prompts come in, all prompts go out, or all responses go out, and then they analyze them to see if there's a prompt injection or what have you. But the problem is that it's not always clear when data is malicious. I can make my prompt injections, my AI security exploits, look very, very benign to the point that like they're, like a human probably couldn't tell that I'm doing something something fancy with it. So that your your classifiers or whatever you're using, your judge models, definitely also can't tell. And so to this point, we've never run into a system that was definitively able to block our AI security attacks. It slowed us down before and it's made the system like arduous and annoying to test. Uh, but it also just made it arduous and annoying to use. And that's really the trade-off between security and usability that, you know, the industry has been ranting about for who knows how long. And so, like you mentioned, it really is just a bandage that is going to potentially slow down your attackers, but it doesn't fundamentally solve the problem. And I think that the main reason that developers find this so difficult to resolve is because this is a paradigm that they haven't encountered in the past, where an application component is not just at runtime, but at prompt time, changing how trustworthy that component is. We're used to setting up objects and systems that like once I initialize it, I give it a set of permissions and throughout its lifetime, it more or less retains those permissions. Like you're not gonna go to bed one day as admin and then wake up as a, a an APT group unless you know I give you $2 million in cash at your front door. Like that's just, yeah. it just doesn't really happen. But AI components are completely dependent on the data that they receive. So now we have to stop thinking about security in terms of component-based segmentation but we have to think about security in terms of data flows within our application architectures. And that, not our security fundamentals, but that way of thinking, that paradigm is what's novel about AI security. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring it up like that because, you know, like what you were describing with the image of hiding data and whatnot and exfiltrating it that way. I mean, that's been executed in the wild so few times. And every single time that it's ever been executed, I mean, I don't want to say ever, right? But the times that we know of, it was like a nation state actor that basically had no other way that was getting around controls of some method, you know, like someone of that capability level, right? So it's not like even security teams were harping on devs to be wary of images that are, you know, being used to upload data. Like no one, it's such a, it's such an outlier that, I mean, I don't think about it until other people like yourself bring it up, right? Like, I mean, that's just, that's just how it is. And I, I do this thing every day, which is, I mean, maybe it's, I guess maybe it's bad that I admit that, but I don't like, I, I just don't think of images like that, right? Because you're kind of desensitized to images all day long. You know, you're looking at the computer. There's a million different images that you're looking at all day long. You're not thinking necessarily but there's something embedded in there that's my personal data or someone else's personal data that I could get access to, right? Like kind of takes that hacker mindset to, to be, I, I guess, paranoid, right? About everything in front of you. Well, it, so I go back to the old adage of, of defenders think, think in lists and attackers think in graphs. Because if we, if we start harping just on the images, right, we're going to end up in a situation where our only cross-site scripting filtration is that we remove JavaScript script tags. But that's not the only way to get JavaScript to execute on a system. And images are not the only way for us to exfiltrate data from an AI platform. So we need to be thinking about what are the different ways that if one of my language models does become malicious, how might it pull data out of the platform or make changes that it's not authorized to make? And if the answer is I can't prevent that, I really need to make sure that that language model in whatever operational context it's executing in is never exposed